Welcome to the place where we gain knowledge through the lens of creativity. I am Aaron Dworkin, and this is Artful Science. Thanks again for joining me here on Artful Science. Today's show is A2, the connection between alcohol and AFib. And our guest is Greg Marcus, who serves as Associate Chief of Cardiology for Research at the University of California, San Francisco Health. Greg, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. I'm delighted to be here. So, you know, this is, uh, you know, just a, a show I'm really, really interested in. I think so many of our uh, audience are um, because we hear things a lot of the time, but you're really an expert on arrhythmias. And so first, I just wanted to talk arrhythmias in general. Do we understand, you know, what, what is it? Is it? Is it a kind of heart attack? Like what's physically happening in our bodies with an arrhythmia? Yeah, I really appreciate the question because I think this is a common and understandable source of confusion that's really important to clear up. And that is there are various forms of heart disease. Not all heart disease is the same. And it might make sense to start with what is a heart attack. Um, and what that means is usually an abrupt blockage of blood flow to the heart, which then can cause death of some of the heart tissue. That's more of a, what we might refer to as a plumbing issue whereas arrhythmias are much more of an electrical issue. And there are many. Uh, what defines an arrhythmia um, will include really anything that is too fast of a heart rhythm or heartbeat, too slow or irregular. And within the category of arrhythmias, there are many types. Many are quite benign. Some are even healthy, something called sinus arrhythmia, is something that the most healthy people have, that the heart rate itself varies with as you take a breath, breath in and a breath out. And then others can cause, can manifest in various ways and have various consequences. And I remember, and I think it just shows, especially kind of as a lay person or as an artist, kind of my ignorance of it, but I remember years ago being at the doctor and saying, you know, I was a little you know, worried about things or whatever. And, and they were like, okay, they did this test and they're like, okay, so it appears you have a sinus arrhythmia. And I was like, oh, my, right, my initial reaction is, oh my God, I have this arrhythmia. What does that mean? They're like, it's normal, you know? Yeah. So, uh, so that's really interesting that there's that. And sorry, I think I interrupted you. You were going to describe some other arrhythmias. Well, I was going to say when I was a medical student and I was the subject and was laid down on the table with a bunch of my uh, classmates and a teacher listened to my heart and said the same thing. You have sinus arrhythmia. And my response was, no, I don't. I don't have an arrhythmia. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's actually a, a sign of health. Um, so I was going to make the point that um, different arrhythmias have uh, different consequences. And atrial fibrillation itself is unique in it and, and really arguably especially important for a couple of reasons. One, uh, it's extraordinarily common. So as we all age, the risk that we will experience atrial fibrillation goes way up. It's something that affects millions of people. If you took everyone just off the street that was at least 60 years old, at least 5% of all of them have already had atrial fibrillation. Uh -huh. And what atrial fibrillation is, is the top chambers, the atria, are fibrillating uh, conducting in this rapid chaotic fashion, that then gets transmitted to the lower chambers, the ventricles. The ventricles are what are essentially responsible for the pulse. And that fibrillation of the atria uh, has several consequences. One is that it can make the pulse rapid and irregular. That itself can make an individual not feel well, and the symptoms can be variable. They may feel fatigued, they may feel faint, they may feel their heart racing. Um, the other risk, if one is in atrial fibrillation over a long period of time, such that their lower chambers are going fast, 110, 120 beats per minute at rest, even when they're sleeping, and that's very important 
to emphasize because the heart rate going up with exercise just with walking is completely normal and is expected. But when it's going that fast for weeks and weeks, even when someone's asleep, for example, there's a risk of the heart weakening over time and that can lead to something called heart failure. And then the other thing that's fairly unique in the realm of arrhythmias is we think because there's stagnation of blood flow in those atria that blood clots can form and if those break off and travel somewhere, such as the brain, that can abruptly occlude blood flow and, and uh, really required oxygen and nutrients and cause a stroke, for example. Uh, and in the worst cases, maybe even death. So atrial fibrillation, even if someone feels fine, they don't feel it at all. The concern is, or the recognition is, there's this risk of stroke and real harm that can occur. And, and that's part of why there's been more and more attention uh, on the disease in addition to it being so common. Right, and that's, and I guess also is, you know, and, and maybe kind of I thought of it as being common because it seems like it's what we see commercials for all the time and people are always referring to AFib and I guess that's because it is so common and so they know so many people are looking for various remedies or solutions and hence the advertising responds to it. Um, and, and also it's just very interesting hearing that there's, there can be some kind of more benign aspects to it, but then also some very, very serious ones. Is there a way to kind of know if one is, is experiencing AFib, whether it could be something that could lead to, you know, the stroke type of possibilities, or could be something that might just be more passing? How, how do we know if we should be taking it really, really seriously? Yeah. Great question and a lot of unknowns there. So generally we've relied on individuals experiencing symptoms, coming to the physician, having a monitor put on that then reveals the atrial fibrillation. The other thing I should mention is that there are very effective therapies to mitigate all of the adverse consequences. There's a catheter ablation procedure that in many patients can render them quite free of atrial fibrillation. And then the uh, commercials you refer to are I believe largely related to blood thinners that work extremely well, are now easy to take and quite safe and have been shown to be very effective at preventing stroke and even prolonging life uh, in atrial fibrillation. So the other important uh, thing to mention is that the risk of stroke, the risk of complications in the setting of atrial fibrillation is also related, we think, to other risk factors. So it's really the people who are older, individuals who have high blood pressure, diabetes, heart failure, that seem to be at the higher risk of experiencing a stroke, for example, in the setting of AFib. So if you are young and otherwise healthy, even if you had AFib, there is no clear evidence that uh, receiving, for example, a blood thinner, that the, the benefit you might gain is worth the very, very small risk of bleeding because that risk is so low. Now, this is precisely what Apple has been interested in. There's a company called AliveCore that makes, makes an EKG device and various other companies in passively detecting atrial fibrillation using a smartwatch. In fact, our group published the first paper on that even before Apple got involved where you infer atrial fibrillation from the irregularity of the pulse. The interesting thing is that is available now. Um, but there isn't consensus among professional societies that that should be widely deployed because there's a risk of false positives. So there's the risk of causing undue anxiety, unnecessary healthcare utilization, people you know, maybe even uh, you know, receiving blood thinners when they don't really need it. So it's actually an active area of investigation that we're still interested in, in pursuing. Gotcha, gotcha. And this is all fascinating. And I have got, you know, my, my Apple Watch and, and have, have certainly checked. Um, and is there, so this kind of gets to kind of this core sense I wanted to try and tackle in the show, um, which is alcohol and AFib. Um, so, you know, I've certainly read somewhere, I think I've even been on, you know, uh, it could be uh, NIH's site where, you know, two to three, you know, drinks potentially in a day for a man or one to two for a woman could potentially be okay or is within that kind of safety realm. But just wondering about alcohol consumption and AFib, do we know any correlations? Is it, is it not healthy? Is it healthy? What do we know? 
Yeah, so two ways to think about that. One is a common question I receive from my patients, why do I have atrial fibrillation? And we know that there are risk factors and there's a growing uh, interest in lifestyle factors, things that are under the control, at least theoretically, of the individual, things that they can do to reduce their risk. And then alcohol and the heart is a very interesting topic because it's complicated and it's not necessarily all good or all bad. So there's evidence from primarily what we would call observational studies. So these are not interventional randomized studies. So we always need to be a little skeptical, take these observational studies with a grain of salt, understanding there could be confounding factors that weren't fully accounted for. But if you look at big studies and, and examine the people who tend to drink in moderation or lightly, meaning one to two drinks uh, per day, on a regular basis without binge drinking. So not more than three, four, five drinks in a setting, but you know, one drink once in a while or one drink a day. And those individuals seem to have a lower risk of heart attack and even in some studies, overall mortality, certainly compared to those that drink more, but there's some evidence even compared to those that don't drink at all. And there's some biologically, biologically uh, reasonable mechanisms that could explain a lower risk of heart attack, that uh, blockage of the plumbing in the, in the arteries we talked about. Now, atrial fibrillation is quite different, and this is all, another reason that it's important to emphasize the electrical issues of the heart. They, they, there's certainly some overlap with the risk of heart attack, and, and one can affect the other, uh, but largely is separate. And there's evidence from these large epidemiologic studies that those who tend to drink more seem to experience a higher risk of atrial fibrillation. Patients often will report that acute consumption, a given episode of drinking, seems to heighten the risk that they will experience an atrial fibrillation episode shortly thereafter. So this inspired a study that we recently uh, completed where we enrolled people who we knew had intermittent episodes of atrial fibrillation we had them wear a continuous EKG monitor so we could know exactly when they were having AFib or if they had any. We gave them a ankle device that recorded essentially alcohol consumption. It, it, it can measure ethanol in sweat, same sort of device that law enforcement uses, for example. Uh, we also had them push the button on the device, which would timestamp whenever they had a drink of alcohol. And we validated that with a blood test that tells us about alcohol consumption in the previous few weeks. And we found that indeed, when one had a drink of alcohol, either via the button press or via the sensor, that substantially and statistically significantly heightened the risk that a discrete atrial fibrillation episode would occur a few hours later. And the more alcohol consumed, the higher that risk. Wow. So a common question is, um, <clears throat> well, is there a safe amount of alcohol? Is it, what about just one drink? In this study, we found that even one drink seemed to increase the risk. But an important caveat is this was, was really restricted to those who already had a diagnosis of AFib and were experiencing intermittent episodes. And almost certainly there's heterogeneity in the relationship between alcohol consumption and AFib. So an important next step is to try to identify the individuals that may be more prone to this. <clears throat> Another bigger next step would be to do a true randomized trial of alcohol for the first time, moderate alcohol consumption. And I should emphasize that heavy alcohol is bad for the heart. That's, there's no question about that. Every study is very consistent. You can actually increase your risk for a heart attack if you drink too much. Um, but we don't know if you drink one glass of wine a day, is that overall better or worse for your health? And are there certain characteristics that individuals have that may influence their particular uh, response to alcohol? Gotcha, gotcha. And when you say also the heavy drinking, at what point is that threshold met? Is that more than two drinks or is it different for women or men? Yeah, so it's probably related to body weight, and we extrapolate that very broadly from uh, men and women. Well, obviously, you know, you could have a, a heavier woman and a lighter man, so it's not certainly not perfect. I would say, I, I would recommend, medically speaking, uh, to uh, avoiding more than two kind of standard drinks 
in 24 hours, a standard drink being a glass of wine you might have at a restaurant, a shot of hard liquor, or a 12 ounce uh, can or bottle of beer. Going beyond that increases risks for um, various cancers, including breast cancer uh, and colon cancer, increases the risk of cognitive issues, dementia, increases the risk for high blood pressure, certainly increases the risk for, for atrial fibrillation. And there's some evidence increases the risk for heart failure and heart attack when you're drinking in those uh, greater amounts. Wow. Well, that is not good news for anyone who wants more than those two glasses. So, and, and, but also so helpful. And I think that's what's so important is to, is to know because it does help us to make those choices on a day-to-day -day basis uh, or week-to-week -week basis of, of, of our lifestyle, which can have such an impact. So this has all been fantastic. Unfortunately, we're just out of time, but I always like to ask um, of all of our guests here on Artful Science, do you either have an artistic practice that you like to do uh, or discipline or just an art, art uh, at arts discipline that you love? Well, so I used to play a lot of uh, jazz drums when I was younger, and that morphed a bit into blues piano, even though I kind of forgot how to read music, but I still improvise um, and do certainly enjoy that. It's a way to relax. Uh, and there are a lot of um, similarities between improvising on the piano, trying to exercise creativity, discover something new and, and science. And so I, I really appreciate kind of the general theme of your show and think that there's so much cross fertilization there and, and so many similar, similarities that may not be evident. Greg Marcus, thank you for helping us gain knowledge through the lens of creativity here on Artful Science. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you.